Hi guys. Um, so it is officially 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'm gonna get started. Um, my name is Lena Bader. You can just call me Lena. Um, I am a former AP biology teacher and my goal here today is to help alleviate some of the concerns you as students or as teachers might have uh, surrounding the AP biology exam, which has not been canceled. Um, so the presentation is gonna be broken up into three smaller sections. We're going to start with just an intro to the DNA Learning Center. Um, we'll also talk briefly about what changes College Board has made to this year's exam administration. Um, we'll follow that up with a question and answer session. So part of the question and answer session will be based on questions I received through Instagram. So thank you to everyone who contributed to that question pool. Um, the second part of the Q&A will be for you guys. If you have any questions at that point in the presentation, there will be a little bit of a pause. So you can um, either type a question in the chat, or if you'd like, you can feel free to raise your hand. I'll call on you. Um, and then you can you know, use your microphone to ask the question. The last part of the presentation um, will be an opportunity for you guys to take a look at a DNA-based free response question. I'm going to go over as much of that as possible today, although we only have an hour to work together today. Um, however, we will be having another one of these AP Bio Chats this Thursday at the same time, at the same link. Um, so I will see you guys then uh, to continue this presentation. All right, so let's just go ahead and dive into this. I do want you guys to know, um, you know, for your own purposes, that this is being recorded and could be posted to the DNA Learning Center's website or its social media channels. Um, so keep that in mind. All right, and I already see David M. in the chat says, hi, Ms. Bader, what will the format of the exam be? Is it being updated due to coronavirus? Um, so yes, so that's gonna be a little bit later on in the presentation, but to answer right now, um, they're going to administer this examination online. It's gonna be 45 minutes instead of its usual time. And um, in order to, to, to keep the assessment fair, um, they're getting rid of the multiple choice section because obviously, um, being at home, uh, there would be a lot of opportunities to cheat for multiple choice. Um, so it's going to be fully free response. Uh, there are still some details that are forthcoming. So um, we can talk a little bit more about that when we get through the slides. But that's the general format. It'll be 45 minutes and it'll all be free response. And that's happening across all AP exams. Great question. All right. Um, so this is largely an experiment of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory's DNA Learning Center. Um, we're producing a lot of live content, so you can check out our website and give us feedback on things that you think we're doing well, things that you think we could improve, um, and, you know, things that you think we're doing terribly. Um, okay, so the purpose of DNA LC Live is to sort of replace as much as possible the field trips and programming that we would do in person um, when we're not in a pandemic. So um, we're planning on doing things like wet labs, uh, demonstrations of using bioinformatic tools, at-home activities you could do. Uh, yesterday, we did a really fun kitchen science demonstration. And eventually, hopefully, we're looking to engage with scientists and provide help for educators. You can check our live programming out and a full schedule um, by going to dnalc.cshl.edu forward slash dnalc hyphen live. I'm going to leave this here in case any of you wants to screenshot this or write down the web address. And I can put it in the chat in a second. Um, also, if you don't already, um, all you young folks can follow us on Instagram. Um, and I guess if there are any older folks in the building, they can follow us on Facebook. Um, I think everyone uses YouTube, so you can follow us there or on Twitter. All right, so let's jump into this. So the format, um, this is taken directly from the College Board's website because I didn't want to miss any details. So this is what they have posted on their AP website right now. So again, as I mentioned before, it's a 45 minute online free response exam. 
um, the content is going to focus on, so this is where things get a little like dicey. They're saying they're going to focus on things that you would only cover from uh, the beginning of the school year through March, which obviously is gonna look different based on your teacher. Um, and for bio, I think this is gonna be pretty problematic. I know my colleague used to start with evolution and then work his way backwards. Um, that would really disadvantage those students, this program, um, but I guess it's sort of luck of the draw in that sense. Um, so I'll tell you guys what specifically bio-wise is going to be on this exam. You're going to use whatever internet accessible device you have. So you could use a computer, you could use a smartphone, you could use a tablet. You also have the option to hand write instead of type your responses um, and take a picture of it and then upload it as part of your response. So they are being pretty flexible about the type of electronic device you use. Um, and then if you have any concerns about not being able to access the internet or not having a device, you can contact the college board and they will do their best to make sure that you have access to that technology. Um, if this doesn't sound like something you would want to do, although it seems like everyone here does want to participate in this because they're in this chat, um, you are eligible to receive a refund at no charge um, and you should look at the college board's website for that information. All right, so AP Bio folks, what do you need to know? So usually the AP Biology exam is this beast of an exam. It covers eight units um, that are pretty dense in information. This spring only, only units one through six will be tested, which covers everything from the molecular basis of living things, so your biochemistry, your organic chemistry, all the way through gene expression and regulation. Um, I think today we're gonna be focusing mostly on units five and unit six, since we are the DNA Learning Center. And I think a lot of the questions that you guys asked were pretty unit six heavy. Um, so are there any questions up until now about like what the AP Bio exam is going to look like? I'm gonna give everyone a second to respond in the chat if they want to, if not, I will proceed. Okay. Um, okay, so we sort of covered this already. There's no multiple choice. That's gonna ensure fairness. Um, it's entirely free response, 45 minutes long. There are more details forthcoming, but based on the 45 minute long examination, I'd be willing to bet that they're going to give you two of the long style free response questions. Um, since generally speaking, each of those would take you about 22 minutes and 22 plus 22 is 44, which is like perfect on the nose for this 45 minute long exam. But more details are forthcoming and we'll let you know about those as soon as we learn them. All right, so I'm gonna jump right into some of the questions that you guys had. So the first question um, was, what are some resources I can use to study? College Board has an online learning center with pre-recorded videos and lessons, so you can check those out. AP uh, publishes all of the old free response questions that they've used, so you can look at those, and some of them even have scoring guidelines, so that's really useful, especially since this is going to be a free response exam obviously refer to your textbooks. And then I wanted to spend a little bit of time today talking about the DNA Learning Center animations. So we actually have a website um, that I wanna show you guys. So it's dnalc.cshl.edu forward slash resources forward slash animations. Um, and it's really cool. I like it because it is broken up into um, categories. So you can see here that, oops, um, that there are experiments and techniques. So if you are struggling with the labs, um, especially the molecular bio labs, you can look at those. It, there are videos on just the simple structure of DNA and how it was discovered. There's a lot of his, history uh, behind DNA uh, in those animations. So if you're interested in that kind of fun fact aspect of DNA science, that's a good section to go to. Transcription and translation and replication, which I know are everyone's favorites. Uh, just kidding. Uh, those have some really great three-dimensional animations with explanations, so you should check those out as well. Um, and then there are some extras on disease and mutation. So definitely, definitely, definitely would recommend visiting the Cold Spring Harbor DNA Learning Center animation website. All right. Um, I'm nervous for the free response questions. <laughs> That's not great because it's all free response questions now. Um, any tips? 
So yes, I have a set of tips here. The, my first piece of advice is to start your studying by reviewing those four big ideas. Um, the ones that are gonna be most relevant to us today are the hereditary basis of life, like how information is shared between organisms, and then interactions between molecules. So those are gonna be our two big ideas that we'll focus on today. Um, but they oftentimes are a really great kind of like calming device that if you remember the big idea, you can sort of in your brain start to piece together the details that will help you put together a really uh, great free response answer. Um, answer the question. This seems really common sense, but having read student responses for several years, um, I feel like students sometimes panic and then go off on tangents that aren't related to the, the actual question. You wanna focus your answer to just answering what they're asking you for. Um, use specific examples, and I'm gonna show you what I mean by that later on in the lesson, um, but you wanna be as specific as possible. Don't use vague, broad terms because the test writers or the test scorers will be able to tell that you really have no idea what's going on. Using an example will really show that you have a mastery of the knowledge as opposed to a superficial understanding. Um, so for example, if they ask you to describe what a gene mutation is, you know, a basic level understanding would say, you know, a gene mutation is a change in DNA. If you really know what you're talking about, you'll be able to give examples. Um, so you can embellish that answer by saying, you know, a frame shift mutation is when the reading frame gets messed up and codons um, are all changed and therefore the polypeptide sequence is entirely changed, right? So you want to give those specific examples. And then last but not least, using vocabulary is so important. You want to use those biology buzzwords in order to secure a, like a five. Um, and make sure you're using them frequently, but also make sure you're using them correctly. You shouldn't just pepper in words because it's fun. You should use them in a meaningful way that actually adds to your answer and addresses the question. I recommend before going into this test, one of the first things you should do is create like an organizer of the six units um, and maybe make a list of what those key buzzword terms are and make sure you really know and understand what they are before um, trying any of these free response questions. All right, next question. I wasn't gonna include this, but I did because I feel like it's useful to know what you don't need to know. Um, someone said phylogenetic trees, what do I need to know? Uh, for this examination, you don't need to know phylogenetic trees. Yay! Um, so phylogenetic trees are technically in unit seven, which is part of natural selection. Uh, they're assuming you haven't gotten to that yet, so no need to know how to draw these things or understand them. They won't be on the exam, although I guess just generally as a scientist, maybe you would want to know this, but for right now, it's low priority. Uh, ooh, this one has an emoji in it. How do I remember the difference between transcription and translation? Exploding smiley face emoji. Um, the way that I told my students to remember it and the way I remembered it as a student is just it comes alphabetically before translation and by it I mean transcription. So transcription has a C in it, translation has an L, C comes before L so transcription happen, happens first. Um, and this is the last step of, oh sorry, um, yeah, okay. And then you just need to know this like overall process that uh, transcription is DNA to RNA, and then RNA to protein is translation. Uh, Hannah just asked in the chat, when we go through a practice question, can you highlight how to incorporate vocab? Yes, absolutely. So we'll do that at the end of the session. Um, but generally what I like to do in my head is I always start by thinking about the question very broadly, and that's why I said remember those big ideas, right? Um, and then as I'm developing my answer, I ask to myself, okay, what specific things are useful to include to, to answer the question? And from that specificity, you need to, and this is where memorization kicks in, 
you do need to have, uh, you know, in your brain, some of these uh, stock vocab words, and then you can incorporate them then. Great question, Hannah. Um, okay. Guys, I took this animation from our website. So shout out to our uh, faithful animators here at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Um, so this question is, how much detail do I need to know about the central dogma uh, gritting teeth emoji? So I've come up with this bulleted list and I've also used this illustration because I think it's really great. So you need to know why it's important, right? Um, it's important because it is essential for building proteins and proteins are like the building block of everything in your cells, right? They're facilitating enzymatic reactions. They are building structural components of your cells that without these proteins, you wouldn't be able to survive, right? So important for living things. The major molecules involved are important. So you need to have a basic understanding of DNA to RNA to protein, but you also need to understand oops, where these processes are happening. So transcription is happening in the nucleus. Translation is happening on a ribosome. You should be familiar with, although they have changed the objective, so you don't have to memorize these, but I think having a good understanding is important. And I would go to our animation for a refresher on this, but you should be familiar with the idea that there are ribosomal RNA components involved in this, that transfer RNAs are helping uh, with the synthesis of polypeptides. And really importantly is this third bullet. Um, I would like highlight this. They love to test on the idea that each of these processes is highly regulated by a series, like by different enzymes, um, by different cofactors, coenzymes, et cetera. These things are not happening just automatically by themselves. Cells have the ability to turn on and off transcription and turn on and off translation. Um, and then, you know, extending on that idea, there are some diseases, right, uh, that target specific processes that might shut down transcription or might tr shut down translation. So the idea that these mechanisms can be turned on or off is really important. Um, you also need to know that errors can occur and know the different types. So be familiar with point mutations, frame shift mutations, missense mutations, and nonsense mutations. And then finally, know how to use a codon chart. Um, your teacher might have used the codon wheel um, I would be familiar with both the wheel and the uh, square matrix. So just make sure you know how to use that. Okay. Um, what does five prime and three prime mean? Help, crying emoji. Okay, um, question and asker, relax. Uh, you're gonna be fine. Five prime and three prime just refers to the direction of DNA. So you have to remember that DNA is directional. It's not just randomly assembled. Um, the five prime and three prime, I always taught my students, it's kind of like north, south, east, west with a compass, but fortunately there's only like an up and a down. There's no side to side. So it's, it's kind of just a mechanism scientists use to help us find the direction of each strand. And remember that the strands run anti-parallel. Does anyone remember what that means? You, if anyone wants to try and respond to that in the chat. I know I've been talking a lot. Um, does anyone remember what anti-parallel means? No? Okay, that's cool. Um, so anti-parallel basically just means that the five prime end of one strand is going to be bound to the three prime strand of the other and vice versa. So they run in opposite directions, but they're parallel to each other. Um, and for those of you folks who struggle to remember which side is the five prime and which side is the three prime, I have two mnemonics, so you can keep the one that you like better. The five prime is the phosphate end, and I just remember that because ph and ph. That sounds like I'm saying a bad word, but I'm not. So they just have the same uh, consonant sound, so five phosphate. All right, if you don't like that mnemonic, the other way I remember it, um, and you kind of have to know your chemistry here for this mnemonic to work, but the five prime, so five is greater than three, and phosphate groups are bigger than hydroxyl groups. 
So if we look at this diagram over here, oops, um, let's see if I can use, oh shoot. Um, sorry guys. So if I use the annotate feature here, um, let's see, draw. So again, the five prime end is the side that has the phosphate. The three prime end is the side that has the hydroxyl. And you might be wondering where the numbers five and three come from. They're coming from the number of carbons. So remember DNA is made up of a five carbon sugar called deoxyribose. When you take organic chemistry at some point in your life, or maybe your teacher covered it in your AP bio class, you learn that we number carbons and sugars. So it turns out that this deoxyribose, this is the first carbon here. This is the second carbon here. This is the third carbon here. And this third carbon happens to be where the hydroxyl is. So if we use this one down here, one, two, three, the hydroxyl is on the third carbon. Okay, so by that extended logic, right? Where do we think the phosphate group is going to be? It's gonna be on the fifth carbon. So this would be carbon number four. And then when you did your uh, nomenclature, you hopefully learned that this bend here means that there's a fifth carbon right here, right? So attached to that fifth carbon is the phosphate. Um, you don't actually need to be able to count the carbons on a sugar for AP bio exam. It's just good to know because you're going to college soon and you might be taking college chemistry. So again, five phosphate, or you know, five is greater than three, phosphates are bigger than hydroxyls. Cool. Yeah, Lily, uh, it comes from carbon counting. Now let's see if I can get out of annotation mode. Back to my mouse. Ooh, and let's clear those drawings. All right. What biotechnology methods do I need to know for the AP? Uh, there are five big ones, and I've detailed them on these two slides. I couldn't fit them all on one slide. Um, but I would love to, and you know, uh, I guess this is sort of product placement, but it's our own product, so it's cool. I would urge you to go check out the DNA Learning Center animation page. They have really, if you're going to check out their page for anything, it's for these five experiments. Um, they have really great logical breakdowns of these uh, complete with animations and uh, some, some text. So PCR, you need to know what it does and it helps us make more DNA from a small number of copies of DNA. And why this is useful is because generally when we're doing DNA analysis, we need more than one strand of DNA, right? Um, and this is also just like real world wise why a tiny amount of DNA taken from like a crime scene or a suspect uh, can still be used reliably because we can use PCR to make lots of copies of that, you know, single piece of DNA or whatever. Um, you need to understand the different temperatures and what's happening to DNA at each step. So when we heat the DNA, it's separating. When we cool it down, uh, primers are added. And then when we warm it back up a little bit, it's warmed up just fast enough so that nucleotides can be added. Um, you need to understand the different reagents used, specifically that there's an enzyme called TAC polymerase. Um, and I think it's a really useful activity to compare and contrast PCR to in vivo replication. That just means replication in cells. Um, and it, it'll really help you understand the reason why we use PCR. For gel electrophoresis, you need to know that it's used to visualize DNA. You need to know it separates DNA based on size and charge, where larger molecules move less in the gel and smaller molecules move a greater distance in the gel. If you have trouble remembering that, you can think of a traffic jam. If you are on a motorcycle, you're going to be more successful in getting to your de uh, destination and moving far. If you are stuck on a school bus, you're not getting anywhere fast. Um, and then you also need to know that the charge of DNA is negative. So when you do run a gel, you should apply the negative current to your sample. So that way it moves away from the current. All right. Transformation. So transform literally just means to change, right? So we use a transformation to change um, an organism. Usually we're doing this with like bacteria or yeast. The idea is that we insert foreign or uh, new DNA with some sort of desirable gene into that organism. And then we get that organism to express that gene for us. 
uh, you might have done this in your classroom with a GFP gene where you made bacteria glow. Uh, recombination or recombinant DNA, again, if you just think of what recom recombine means, uh, it means that you're taking pieces and putting them together again, right? So with recombination, we're using something called a restriction enzyme to cut up a gene and plug it into usually a plasmid, and then that plasmid can be used in transformation, which is what I just discussed. Um, restriction analysis and digests are important to know. So you just need to know that these things called restriction enzymes exist. They're kind of like scissors, but um, unlike scissors, which you could use to you know, cut anything, these are specific scissors. So they cut DNA at specific sites based on a specific sequence that they recognize. Um, all right. This next question is how much do I need to know about the chemistry of DNA? Um, you definitely need to know the nucleotide structure. So you need to know what a phosphate is, you need to know what a, the deoxyribose sugar is and the nitrogenous base, and you should be able to identify those three components on a diagram. Um, you need to know the base pairing rules and be familiar with Chargoff's rules. Although I guess now with multiple choice out of the equation, I can't really think of a, eh, no, they probably could give you some small data analysis with Chargoff's rules. So you should be familiar with uh, the idea that the proportion of A's and T's is always going to be equal or roughly equal and same with G's and C's. You should know that DNA is negatively charged because of the phosphate groups. We talked about directionality already and this is important. So you need to understand that the, and in fact, if this is going to show up on a free response, they're going to ask you about this. So the bond types holding the bases together um, are hydrogen bonds. Anyone know why that's important? So my question again is, why is it important that the bond types holding the nitrogenous bases together are hydrogen bonds? Anyone know why? Okay, um, so the basic idea is that replication requires the pulling apart of strands. And if those bonds were too strong, or if they were like covalent bonds, for example, um, that would require a lot more energy for the cell to carry that out. And since replication happens every time you divide cells, uh, that would be like a lot of ATP burden on your cell system. So it's an efficiency question. And then phosphate sugar linkages um, are covalent. The idea is that the backbone is like strongly held together. Uh, these are called phosphodiester bonds. Okay, I've been talking a lot. Are there any questions from you guys right now? Um, either questions about the questions that we just answered um, or any questions of your own? I'm gonna give you guys a second here. If not, we're gonna go right into free responses. No questions? Fantastic. Okay. So I'm just reposting the hints that I gave you before for answering these free responses. Um, let's go right to a question. So this was posted on our website. So you can access the PDF by going to our dnalc.cshl.edu um, website and ask, accessing the live portion. So um, the First thing that I would sort of urge you guys to do when you get a question like this is one, don't panic, because I know it can look pretty overwhelming to see this like ginormous data table and all of these words. Um, the first thing you should know is that this longer form of free response, uh, it's advisable to try and get this done in about 22 minutes. So you have like a good chunk of time to get this done. Um, so obviously you should read the question first. And then as you're reading the question, I think it's important to sort of ask yourself uh, like what concept they're testing you on and start thinking in that mindset. And then try to find patterns in the data or any weird drastic changes, right? So I'm gonna read this, actually I'm not gonna read the question to you, but I'm gonna give you guys a minute to read the question to yourself and then we'll debrief on what the concept is and where weird things in the data are, okay? So take a minute, um, sort of read through this question, and then we'll debrief in a second.
Okay. So hopefully when you went through the question, you were able to determine that the topic is what? Does anyone want to try and give a response in the chat? What was the topic or topics being covered here? Yes, David M hit the nail on the head. So yeah, by and large, we're talking about gene expression. In other words, we're going from transcription to translation. Um, and then any other concepts that we see may be brought up here. Like there's, there's sort of one, and it, it goes along with gene expression, but it's more specific. So it's one of the buzzwords that you should be familiar with. It starts with an E and ends with an enzyme. Yes, Lily, okay, great. Um, so those are the two topics that they're really covering here, right? Transcription and translation, and then uh, enzymes, absolutely. And then did anyone notice any weird, uh, I guess, aberrances in the data or like, um, you know, patterns? Any weird things that are going on here? All right, so I guess uh, this, we should take a step back for a second and ask ourselves like, what experiments are they doing? What's the experimental question here? Well, if we look at this, it looks like um, they're setting up this experiment where they're adding different proteins to three different sort of genes, right? and seeing what the effect is on RNA levels, protein levels, and enzyme activity levels. So there is a cause and effect sort of question being addressed here, right? Um, it's does adding protein A um, affect RNA levels, protein levels, um, and enzyme activity, right? That's the first question. And then the second question that they're asking is, uh, you know, let's see, can I? Um, maybe I can edit this later. But the second sort of question that they're asking, I'll add it down here, is does adding protein B affect those levels? So same sort of question, right? And they're doing this across three different genes. Oops. Um, and so if we sort of look here, we can start to notice some changes from the untreated groups, right? So what would we call the untreated groups? What is that experimentally? It starts with a, yeah, Marty. All right, so it's a control. Um, and so if we look at the control and compare it to these two experimental groups, right? Addition of protein A over here. Um, I'm quite bad at this Zoom annotation, so I'm really sorry about that. But we can sort of see that we've got these two experimental groups here. So there's like the protein A group, and then there's a protein B group. Uh, can I get rid of the chat? Okay. So there's the protein B group. Oh no. I'm sorry, guys. Uh, okay, so there's the protein B group. And so what we're sort of doing is we're looking at each of these gene expression pathways and seeing how they're affected, right? It's a cause effect question. Um, seeing how they're affected by adding this protein or by adding this protein. And so um, I guess a subtopic here is like the idea of regulation, right? Of transcription and translation. Um, okay, cool. So I'm going to clear the drawings off of this board, and then we're going to keep moving along. So what I've done here is I've color coded the genes so that you can compare gene X with addition of protein A and protein B. 
and then do the same thing with gene Y and then gene Z. So that's where I would start. Um, so what I've done and you know what you could do on the test is just draw yourself a little logic table. So if you look at this blue table down here, this is what I would have produced as a student using like my scratch paper. Um, so you'll see here that I have basically concluded that if we look at gene X, right, so untreated, gene X uh, has 1,200 as its RNA levels, 400 as its protein levels, and 20,000 as its enzyme activity levels. Um, when we add protein A, how does gene X uh, protein, RNA, and enzyme levels change? So let's look over here. Well, it looks like when we add protein A, gene X RNA levels increase, right? So I, in my little logic table here, made myself a little up arrow. So I know that gene X seems to be up regulated at this RNA level, right? So which process then does it seem like protein A is affecting for gene X? transcription or translation if it's increasing the RNA levels? Is it affecting transcription or translation? Well, what process is producing RNA? Um, transcription, right? So we can sort of conclude here that protein A is upregulating transcription in gene X's pathway. Um, and so logically, doesn't it make sense that we would expect the protein levels, right, and the total enzyme levels to increase as well. Absolutely, because if we're, result, if we're making more RNA transcript, then we're probably going to be making more protein and we're probably going to see more enzymatic activity. All right, what's happening to the gene X pathway when we add protein B? Um, well, if we compare to the untreated, it looks like RNA is the same, they're both 1200. Protein is the same, they're both 400. And enzyme activity is the same, right? So is protein B affecting the gene X pathway at all? Probably not, right? Based on this data. Yeah, right on, David. Okay, so let's look at gene Y and gene Z and do the same thing. Um, with gene Y, I noticed that when you added protein A, um, gene Y's RNA transcript levels went down, protein levels went down, and enzyme activity almost stopped, right? Uh, so it seems like protein A is an inhibitor, right, of the transcription of gene Y, right? So there's some sort of blockage happening going from DNA to RNA when you add protein A. When we look at the addition of protein B to gene Y, you'll notice that the RNA transcript levels are the same, the protein levels are the same, but enzyme activity has increased. How could that be? Well. Remember, I sort of told you guys to start by thinking about the big topics that are being tested. If we think back to our unit on enzymes, we remember that there are things that our teacher told us could make enzymes work better and work worse, right? What are some of the things that help enzymes work better? Um, well, we learned that there are these things called cofactors and coenzymes, right? So it is possible that protein B is a coenzyme of this whatever is happening with this gene Y pathway, right? So this gene Y enzyme product, it looks like it's enhanced by the addition of protein B. And so I've indicated that in my little table with an up arrow. All right, and then we do the same thing for gene Z. Um, so with gene Z, it looks like the uh, RNA levels are the same across the board, so protein A and protein B do not affect gene Z's RNA transcription. The protein, it looks like when you add protein A, the protein level stays the same. Um, same with protein B, it doesn't seem to be affecting the protein level, right? And then lastly, when we look at the enzymatic activity, um, adding protein A doesn't seem to affect enzyme activity for gene Z but it does seem to decrease substantially the enzyme activity for gene Z, right? So again, um, that means something is happening at the enzyme level, right? So what, what did we call um, like one of the processes where enzyme activity was inhibited 
How does that happen? What might be happening there? Can anyone propose a mechanism of what might be happening there? Why might enzyme activity be going down? Mm. Okay, so there's something called inhibition. Um, and in this particular case, it could be possible that the uh, protein B is a competitive inhibitor, meaning that it is binding to the active site instead of the substrate, or it could be a non-competitive inhibitor, meaning that it's binding somewhere else on the enzyme, but changing the conformational shape of the active site and therefore decreasing enzyme activity. All right, cool. So that's a pretty quick data analysis breakdown. Um, and so what you would have to do then is turn that into like written conclusions. So um, here is what I did here. I just turned my little table into English, right? So this is the part that I think students find challenging is trying to come up with words based on what they're observing. Um, and remember the original question asked for like what processes are being regulated and support it with evidence. So you've got to use the words transcription and translation and like enzyme reaction, right? So those are the processes that are being regulated. Um, so the conclusions we can draw, protein A seems, to, and if it helps you to organize in like paragraphs or bullets like this, you're allowed to do that on the AP. But I would highly advise against using phrases, like use complete sentences unless they tell you to write a list. Um, so I would say, you know, protein A seems to increase transcription of gene X mRNA and thus increase protein translation and enzyme activity. Protein A seems to decrease or inhibit transcription of gene Y and therefore uh, decrease protein production, nearly stopping enzyme function. And then protein A doesn't seem to affect gene Z at all. All right, and then with our protein B conclusions, we concluded that protein B does not seem to affect gene X at all. Protein B seems to only alter enzyme activity of gene Y and protein B seems to only uh, affect enzyme activity of gene Z. And our explanations for those is that maybe protein B is a coenzyme of gene Y enzyme, and maybe protein B is an inhibitor of the gene Z enzyme. Okay, and that would be a complete full scoring, like get a five on the AP answer, right? It's a lot of writing. It's a lot of thinking. And uh, that's why generally you, you take around 20, 22 minutes to finish this kind of a question. All right, um, lo and behold, you're not done with the question. So there is a quantitative section of this. So at this point, you should fully understand what's going on. They're adding a little bit here. So they say in a follow-up experiment, protein A and B are combined. So we're adding another experimental group, right? So ima imagine adding to this table that we have, right? And we're collecting three new sets of data, right? for protein A and B, this is a handwriting challenge. All right, we're doing A and B combined for X, Y, and Z, right? What do you think's going to happen? So how do you do this? Well, what you can do is you can just look at the data that we've already analyzed and combine the effect. So if we go back here, right, um, we can combine these two effects together and come up with what we think would be the combined effect of adding both proteins together, right? All right, so let's clear these drawings, great. Um, and some graph considerations that you absolutely need to make. So first of all would be what type of graph is appropriate for this data? Um, what should the x-axis be? Your x-axis should always be your dependent variable. What should the y-axis be? Um, it should be your independent variable, right? Oh, wait, lies. Um, so this should be reversed. Um, so don't look at this. This should be your independent. This should be your dependent. In other words, the X will affect the Y, right? So this is the variable you are changing. So this is the manipulated variable. And then this would be the response variable, right? Okay, 
Um, do you want to use multiple graphs or a single graph? That is up to you. Um, I generally, I think for this question, I would prefer multiple graphs just to keep myself organized. The title of your graph will depend on whether you do multiple graphs or a single graph, but it should be descriptive. And then what would the effect of combining proteins A and B be? Obviously, that's a big part of this question. So let's try and go through the first one together. What type of graph would be appropriate for this data? Would we like use a line? So what, do, what are our options? Our options are like line graph, pie chart, bar chart, and like bar and whisker, but bar and whisker is not really, we don't have like a statistical data set here where we're looking at means, medians, et cetera. So what, what type of graph might be good here? Yeah, bar chart would be perfect. So I would pick a bar chart as well. Why not a line graph? When would it be appropriate to use a line graph and why is it not appropriate here? Generally, line graphs imply some form of, yeah, change over time, exactly. Um, and since time, we're not doing time courses here, a uh, bar graph is probably more appropriate. Okay, um, and so to conclude here, um, The drawings. Um, what we can sort of do is extend our little note chart, right? So we can combine uh, the data from protein A and protein B to predict what would happen when we combine the proteins, right? So let's do gene X together. Um, and then we can sort of translate that into a graph just because I think we might be running out of time. Um, so gene X, remember it upregulates RNA, protein, and enzyme, and then adding protein B doesn't change the enzyme at all. So if you added both of these to the mix, right, one protein that upregulates everything and one protein that doesn't seem to make any changes, what do we think the overall effect of combining both might be? Um, I might infer, yeah, so I, exactly, Lily, I might infer that overall we would see upregulation when we combined both proteins, right? Um, let's tackle gene Y now, right? Gene Y, um, when you add protein A to the mix, it seems to downregulate RNA production, protein production, and enzyme production. And so the star that I added here is because it did it like in a really big way. It, it like massively decreased all of these levels. Um, protein B seemed to not affect transcription or translation, but it did seem to upregulate enzyme activity. Um, what do we think the overall effect of mixing these proteins together might be? I could see a couple of maybe different answers here. So does anyone want to give a guess? What do we think might happen when we add protein A and B to the gene Y expression pathway? Okay, well, what happens when you add protein A? Protein A kills the transcript, right? And so is any protein going to be made? If you don't have RNA transcript, will you have any protein? No, right? If you don't have any protein, are you going to have any enzyme activity? If you don't have an enzyme, will you have enzyme activity? This is not a trick question. Right, David. No, you absolutely will not have any enzyme activity. And so will any of this like, so protein B seems to be an enhancer of the enzyme. But if you don't have any enzyme to enhance, are we going to expect any like rescue effect of adding protein B to a gene Y pathway that has already been uh, incubated with protein A? In other words, can protein B save an enzyme that doesn't exist? Probably not, yeah, um, excellent. 
So I would also infer that, you know, uh, these levels would go really down, the enzyme levels for gene Y with both. And then if we look at gene Z, right, mRNA was not affected by protein A, neither was protein and neither was enzyme. Everything was the same as the untreated. And then when you added protein B, it seemed like protein B inhibited enzyme activity of gene Z. So any ideas about what might change here? Well, we know that RNA, if, if nothing is being affected at the RNA level or the protein level by addition of protein A and B, we might not expect there to be any change in the concoction that combines both of the proteins, right? But it seems like protein B uh, inhibits enzyme activity. So what might we expect happen if we incubate with both proteins? What would the net effect be? What might happen here? We might expect, yes, the enzyme activity to be inhibited again, absolutely. And so what we can do um, is we can create some nice scales, create a nice bar chart, um, and compare the untreated to the treated graphs. Um, I have a quick concept check question for you, which is why, in order to obtain full credit, would the AP scorers want you to include the untreated graph or untreated data in your graphs? I think someone answered it earlier in the chat, but I just want to make sure that everyone sort of gets it. Yes. Okay, perfect. You want to show your control data, right? Because this is all kind of useless if you're not comparing it to something, right? All of this data. Okay, cool. And then things here you'll note, you want to make sure you're using an appropriate scale. The reason why I separated onto three graphs is because enzyme activity is measured on the scale of tens of thousands. And it, my bars of protein and mRNA would be really like hard to see if I used that tens of thousands scale. So having three separate graphs allows you to scale things appropriately, okay? All right, and then um, the last sort of question that I wanted to leave you guys with uh, before we ended today's session is just a sample free response question that is not data-based. So if we sort of just, um, let's see, can I draw a giant shape and cover the answer for right now? No. Okay. Well, that's okay. Just ignore the answer for right now and just pay attention to the question. Um, so here it says to discuss the chemical nature of genes, discuss the replication process of DNA and eukaryotes, and explain the types of gene mutations that can occur during replication and their potential effects on organism phenotypes. This is where the specific language and making sure you're actually staying on task is going to be really important. And a strategy that I use um, to do this is I like here, I see a logical breakdown of my essay into sort of three paragraphs, right? So I see in the question cues for me to make a separate paragraph here. So one tiny paragraph describing the chemical nature of genes, one separate paragraph describing the replication process. And then a final paragraph devoted to the types of mutations that can occur, right? Um, and so if you look at my like paragraph or essay that I typed up, again, this is a long free response. So this, your time goal is about 22 minutes to produce this kind of an essay. Um, and then I forget who asked at the beginning of our chat, but someone asked about how to incorporate the vocabulary. I think that like what I mean by starting broad is that with the chemical nature of genes, you obviously are going to describe the structure, right? And so remembering what those structural components are is going to be really important. So for example, in this first paragraph, um, you'll notice that I reference um, the definition of a gene, right? I reference the word locus, right? Because a gene is located at a specific location and we have a fancy science name for the word location. Um, and so the addition of vocabulary comes along with this like narrowing from a broad idea to a more focused idea. Um, the replication paragraph, You'll notice I insert the word semi-conservative because that is a vocabulary word that describes how replication takes place, right? 
um, half of your original strand is uh, conserved, while the other half is produced with new nucleotides. Um, using the word nucleotide and giving specific examples of enzymes here, right? Like you don't have to memorize all of the detail that your AP bio teacher probably made you memorize, but simply including examples like helicase and DNA polymerase means the difference between a response that's like a three and the re a response that's gonna score a five, right? Um, and then finally, in the mutation paragraph, um, I've underlined my key vocab words, point mutation, frame shift mutation, and nonsense mutation. Um, so everyone can sort of, I'm not gonna read this answer to you because I don't wanna insult your intelligence. I know you guys can all read, um, but this is sort of an example of what a exemplar response to this question might be. Okay, any questions from you guys? I think we're gonna wrap things up right about now. Um, if you do have any questions, I'll put my email in the chat. So you can feel free to email me any follow-up questions. I could also email you the answer key to the worksheet um, or the link to the worksheet. I know things were um, posted to our website. So presumably you would be able to access that. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Um, I appreciate everyone's time, and I hope to see you guys again on Thursday.